So welcome everyone to uh, this book talk hosted by New America. And we've got the author Garrett Felber here with us today to talk about his book, Those Who Know Don't Say. It's an incredible book. Um, I will admit that I'm a child of the 80s and 90s. So my introduction to the Nation of Islam came mostly by rap music and final call newspapers and the bean pies uh, on the corner, that sort of thing. And I had really no clue about a lot of the work that the nation was doing um, in the 50s and 60s and how that work intersected with um, the carceral state protest um, of, of all sorts, not just sort of the, the narrative we're fed about, you know, by any means necessary, sort of that Malcolm X quote. Uh, and so that's what we're going to spend today talking about. Um, Garrick's done an incredible job with this book. And so uh, we're going to dive right in. Uh, you begin the book um, with two vignettes from 1962. And so I'd love if you could sort of kick us off today the same way you did with the book, and then give us some sense of how that intersects with the primary thesis of the book. Thanks, Ted. And I just want to thank New America for hosting this and, and Ted for being in conversation with me and, and the generous um, reading of the book. I appreciate that. Um, so I think before, so as you mentioned, both of these vignettes take place in the spring and summer of 1962. And I think it's important um, for listeners to kind of think about, uh, you know, where that's situated within the civil rights movement and era, right? So we, if we think about um, the Greensboro sit-ins, the Freedom Rides um, on one end and the March on Washington, the Birmingham campaign on the other, um, this is really in the heart of what we consider the civil rights movement. And um, so just as I tell these two vignettes, kind of thinking about the images, places, and people that we typically associate with, with that period. Um, because I think, as you point out, it kind of unsettles some of those assumptions. So <clears throat> the first is um, in Los Angeles in April of 1962, two um, Muslim men are unloading suits out of the back of a car outside of the mosque in um, South Los Angeles. Um, two white police officers stop them, ask them about what they're doing, ask them if they're Muslim. Um, this has been part of a much longer campaign of surveillance and harassment by LAPD of Muslims in LA. And then there's sort of conflict over um, what happens next, but basically the LA Times describes this as a blazing gunfight, um, even though all of the Muslims involved were unarmed. And it ends with seven uh, unarmed Muslims shot uh, one of them, William X. Rogers, is paralyzed from the waist down for life, and another, Ronald X. Stokes, who's the mosque secretary, um, is shot and killed at close range as he's walking towards a white police officer with his hands raised in prayer. The other vignette is um, later that summer at Folsom Prison, also, also in California, and essentially Muslim prisoners are in the yard having a, a meeting as they regularly would do, and a prison guard is sort of um, perched taking surveillance photos of them. And there's actually this series of photos that I found in the attorney general's files. Um, as the prison guard approaches, one of the men in the group sort of recognizes that they're under surveillance and says, you know, if they want to take our picture, let's give them a good one. And they stand and they face Mecca and pray. Um, and I, the reason I start with both of these um, is to kind of you know, suggest that what, what does the civil rights era look like if we, if we put these um, untold stories at the center? And, um, you know, both of them are instances of um, state violence and surveillance um, being responded to with nonviolent protest in the form of prayer. So I think um, what it does is it, it sort of ruptures a couple of things that we're taught about the movement. One is it's often either a secularized movement or told through the centrality of the Black church, mm -hmm. um, which is not wrong, but is it, it often um, leaves out Muslims, especially Muslims of African descent. Um, a second is Black nationalism. So often this 50s and 60s period is kind of narrated as um, a recession of Black nationalist thought, right, between on one end Garvey and the UNIA and kind of this flourishing of black nationalism in the 20s and then the emergence of black power. Um, but of course the thread that connects those is the nation of Islam. Um, and then lastly, I think the relationship between 
anti-carceral organizing, and by that I mean, um, you know, anti-police brutality and, and anti-prison work, and the ramp up of, of state repression, um, both of those are often narrated as sort of late 60s, early 70s phenomena, right? Like the, the rise of mass incarceration is seen as something coming out of the 70s and later. Um, often Cointel Pro is what we point to mm-hmm. as the moment of, um, of high state repression, but both of those things are sort of consolidations of a much longer 50 plus year buildup of local, state, national um, repression and organizing against it. So I start with both of those stories to kind of, um, I think, make us question um, what's at the margins often of our stories about the civil rights movement and think about how it, how it um, changes the story if we place those at the center. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, the, it, the first story about, you know, when the, the police uh, shoot the men loading boxes, um, the first thing that comes to mind is the hands up, don't shoot, the, you know, which is uh, the phrase we've heard over the last several years. And that's literally what is happening in that, in that moment. Maybe not the exact words, but the, certainly the mannerisms. And then in the second one, it's, it's, um, it felt very civil rightsy, for, for lack of a, a better term. It's sort of if, if you've got prisoners who are under surveillance and um, they you know, gesture in prayer, and if something were to go wrong, if the corrections officers were to, were to turn violent, there would be no question who was behaving civilly in that moment and who wasn't. And that's very much the strategy that King and the broader, more traditional uh, understanding of the civil rights movement, they sort of latched onto that same, um, that same framing of, of the, the uh, interaction with law enforcement. Uh, so, and this seems to speak to, I think the primary theory that you offer in the book uh, that you call dialects of discipline. Can you unpack that a little bit for us and and tell us what that is, what it means? Yeah. So I always preface talking about the dialectics of discipline with a disclaimer, which is that I I really, when I set out on this book, did not think, oh, I'm going to coin an alliterative phrase with dialectics and use it to frame the book. That wasn't in my my mission. So it, it really did come out of sort of my attempts to grapple with the material in the archive and think about a way to frame and understand what I was seeing both in prisons and in, in the streets, which, um, so, so I'll, I'll start with the dialectics part, which is, um, you know, I think we often think about kind of broad backlash, right? So one of the, one of the um, narratives with mass incarceration is, oh, this was, sort of backlash to, um, by the state to the gains of the civil rights era, kind of this large scale understanding of, of um, resistance and repression. Um, and we have great histories of, of policy, of how mass incarceration was built out of federal and state policies. Um, but what I wanted to get at was really the way that granular interplay between um, people who often aren't in our histories, prisoners, prison guards, police officers, um, you know, people we might just see as kind of regular, so to speak, um, historical figures, how those interactions on a daily level are also shaping the carceral state through a dialectic of kind of of resistance and repression. So to give a concrete example, um, one of the things that I was finding with um, prison litigation um, by incarcerated Muslims was the state responded very specifically at Attica with something called Rule 22. And Rule 22 basically stated that if you had legal materials in your cell that were not your own, you could be punished. And this was targeted at so-called jailhouse lawyers, um, like Martin Sostre, who I write about, who were writing up writs on behalf of a huge swath of people who didn't have that same legal literacy. So they would just fill out the whole legal form, and then you just had to enter your name. So, So what I was trying to capture with the dialectics is the way that on the ground at somewhere like Attica, there are these these this interplay between the state and and its captives um, to kind of that lead to small scale developments, which ultimately build up the carceral estate. And then the discipline piece um, is really thinking about discipline in in kind of three ways. So one of them is probably the most traditional Foucauldian way is is the state's ability to punish, coerce um, subjects deemed deviant. 
the other is discipline as resistance. So whether that's individual or collective. So I what I was finding is that there are all these ways in which Muslims in the nation of Islam would use individual um, discipline, whether that's, um, you know, immaculate dress, not eating pork, um, prayer, all of these sort of things um, that are very regimented and disciplined or collective discipline. So um, an example for people who are familiar with the autobiography of Malcolm X, there's this really uh, pivotal scene in the book, right, where all mm -hmm. these folks yep. come out in front of the precinct and, and they gather and he sort of like waves his hand right. and everyone dissipates. And that's often, that anecdote is often used to demonstrate how powerful Malcolm was. But I think it also demonstrates how powerful discipline, collective discipline was, that you could have thousands of people who could go one way or the other, but have so much control and collective force, right? That's what scared police, not just that Malcolm had this sort of position of power. Um, so that's the second piece. And then the last one is really disciplinary knowledge. So what I found was the ways that this kind of constellation of journalists, scholars, um, and prison officials of all ranks, whether they be prison guards doing daily surveillance or commissioners, um, penologists, they all sort of came together to assemble a, a ways of knowing the nation of Islam that I think still impact our understandings today. So, so the dialectics of discipline was my attempt to kind of grapple with those ideas of the relationship of discipline as coercion, discipline as resistance, and then disciplinary knowledge, the way that carceral knowledge about um, people in our society is developed. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and, and again, sort of going back to my, my understanding of the nation as a, as a, like a young adolescent, um, one of the images that have, has stayed with me is in the public enemy videos. We have the guys in the suits and very militaristic sort of the marching. Um, I think they're like the fruit of Islam, I think was what the yeah. set was called or the, this group. And it was, it was, um, it sort of conveyed that discipline is required. And to your point, not just as a body, but even collective discipline, or I'm sorry, individual discipline in what you eat and uh, sort of how you take care of yourself, which also, you know, sort of um, harkens back to, or maybe employs respectability politics, to, which sort of found its way in the Christian church, but I think was a tool of, of the civil rights movement. And you make the case beautifully that it wasn't just the black church, it was also in the mosque where some of these strategies were employed. Um, so, and so I guess before we kind of dive into the intersection of protest and transformative figures and sort of the carceral state, I think most folks' understanding of the nation today is through controversial figures like Louis Farrakhan. So can you give us some history about the, the history of the, the, um, of the Black Muslim and then sort of how the, the terms have come, how they've adopted them or pushed back on those terms, and then sort of complicate our understanding of the nation and get us away from just this, the public framing that's happened over the last few decades? Yeah, that's... Um... That's a great question, because I think what I found with um, studying the nation is it's a group that um, is both understudied, but a lot of people seem to think they know quite a bit about, right? There's like a very, there's a lot of ideas circulating, um, and those ideas tend to be pretty narrow. So, so it's not something that people just say, oh, I'm ignorant about this. It's like people have a sort of like anecdotal sense of what the nation is or isn't. Um, so, you know, the nation is formed in Detroit in 1930, and really from 1930 until 1959, I'd say, um, there's a period in which it's mostly, you know, in black, commu black urban communities uh, across the North and, and starting in the West. There are some examples in the, in the Deep South too, which I, I think are really interesting in kind of unsettling the ways that we think about it as a Northern urban movement. Um, and, and during that time, really white America has very, little knowledge about the nation of Islam. Um, Elijah Muhammad for most of this period from 1934 afterwards is sort of the uh, figurehead of the nation. Um, but the understanding of, of the NOI through this period tends to be very orientalist in, in journalists' um, renditions of it. They, they're called a cult. There's sort of all of these ways in which um, they talk about like the trappings of um, these different sort of 
oriental themes right, right. so that and then and that takes a really sharp turn in 1959 specifically because that's the moment when um this documentary the hate that hate produce by mike wallace later of 60 minutes fame along with a black journalist lou lomax um produce this six-part series called The Hate That Hate Produced. And what it does is it introduces a new framework for understanding the nation of Islam and black nationalism as reverse racism or what they call black supremacy um, or black hate. And what they do is they ask for the first time really um, kind of mainstream civil rights organizations to weigh in and as you can imagine, in 1959, there's a lot at stake for like the NAACP and groups to have to make public statements on the Nation of Islam. And, and they double down and they sort of say, yes, this is, you know, we denounce hate, whether it's white people or black. I mean, very much a both sides argument that we're familiar with today, right? right? Some groups even um, call them the black KKK. Um, so suddenly there's this new, and this isn't just a new framework for the Nation of Islam, it's actually an emerging framework to understand black nationalism, like this idea of black hate or reverse racism is new at that point. And I think it actually has huge ramifications for then when black power comes right. about, right? Because it's a white liberal framework for misunderstanding black right. power. Right. Um, so, so that is one really pivotal moment. And then shortly thereafter, um, C. Eric Lincoln, who's a doctoral student trying to do a dissertation on the Nation of Islam, and most of his um, his advisors are sort of like, I don't know what this is. Why would you do a dissertation? And he uses the popularity, this kind of explosion of interest in the Nation of Islam because of the documentary, to pitch a full fledged dissertation and then a book. And this book, Black Muslims in America, becomes in 1961 widely read by college students, some of whom you know are young Black radical students who have a lot of interest in the nation. Um, but also carceral officials. So all of these police chiefs and wardens um, who have been trying to gather information throughout the 1950s um, latch on to both Lincoln's book, and he also, uh, I should say, is um, complicit in this. Like he, he offers his services to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. He goes and t gives talks to police officers. Um, but they also latch on to this phrase, the black Muslims. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's like overnight in 1961, suddenly this group that has been either referred to through these derisive terms like a cult or whatever, but also just as Muslims, suddenly become the black Muslims. And there's this period where Malcolm is really adamant about trying to squash this because he says, you know, we're not black Muslims, we're Muslims. Right. Um, there's, no, there's no framework within the nation of Islam for, for understanding Islam as kind of a racialized, I mean, they understand all black people to be Muslims, right? That's the, the idea of the nation of Islam is that all black people are Muslims originally and they need right. to find Islam. So it makes no sense within nation theology. And um, really to this day, I think that that term black Muslims has stuck, but what the, the sort of utility of that phrase to the state is that they can use it quite malleably, malleably to say it's not actually recognized within the Muslim world as a legitimate form of Islam. It's actually this politicized hate group. So, so there's a way that the sort of um, adjective black before Muslim is used to discredit its standing as a religious group. And as, as I show in the book, that's actually um, pivotal for the ability to organize in prisons, because if they're understood as a hate group and not a religion, it opens the door for all sorts of suppression right. and repression of, of Muslims inside. Right, and so, and, and so it's with the book, but also the reason the book is popular among police forces and corrections officers is because there is now a nation of Islam population within the prisons. Uh, and, and folks are, the, like the wardens and police officers are wanting to know exactly what's going on. And so how did they come to make up part of the, the uh, you know, so much of the prison population to the point where they were under surveillance and where they were, you know, making these uh, photos to, to sort of frame their peaceful protest? 
And I, in the book, you mentioned a little bit about sort of resisting military draft and that sort of thing. So I'd love to, for you to give us some sense of the intersection between the carceral state and then how black Muslims become squarely in its, in its uh, sights. Yeah, so I mean, if, if we think about the sort of most famous um, Muslim draft resistor, right, Muhammad Ali, um, he is so often understood within the content, his decision to not um, be drafted in Vietnam is, is often, I think, misunderstood as part of 60s anti-war radicalism, rather than the context in which it should be understood, which is Nation of Islam draft resistance. So the fact is, no member of the nation would ever be drafted. You know, I mean, Wallace Muhammad um, in the early 60s was doing time in federal prison for draft resistance. You know, the, the, the eventual person who takes over the Nation of Islam after his father's death. Um, so, so that go dates all the way back to World War II. And during World War II, Elijah Muhammad and most of the men within the Nation of Islam um, refused to register with, with the Selective Service. And this is not necessarily out of a sort of pacifist anti-war position, but rather out of um, their belief that they are not citizens of the United States. Um, so they constitute the largest constituency of black draft resistors during World War II. Because World War II, um, really the sort of mainstream protest movement of World War II is the double V campaign. So this right. idea of sort of, you know, warring against fascism abroad and racism at home, sort of right. beautiful service, but in return, the actualization of democracy. Right. And in that context, um, you know, a hundred or more Muslims go to federal prison. And what they, the, the thing I, I found is they're sort of in this really diverse political atmosphere where they're actually in federal prisons with prison abolitionists. Um, with pacifist resistors, mostly through peace movements, but people like Bayard Rustin, um, yeah. who, you know, eventual, uh, you know, figures in the civil rights movement who were also doing time in federal prison, um, who are waging desegregation campaigns in the prisons, something that the Nation of Islam does not take part in. So during the 40s, what's, what's interesting about this kind of arc is that during that period, the, the Federal Bureau of Prisons see Muslims inside as, as quote unquote model prisoners. Because they're basically a small group that's kind of insular, that want basic religious rights and aren't making waves in the same way that these abolitionist, anti-racist pacifists are. Right. And the interesting thing is by 1960s, the, the 40s to the 60s has the same, James Bennett is the head of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And in the 60s, he compares the Muslims inside to those like Rustin in the 40s in terms of the hell they're raising. Right. And you can kind of trace that development through, I mean, you know, Malcolm and others who have gone through the prison system and really started challenging um, the, the, you know, conditions of their confinement as well as their lack of religious rights through the 40s and 50s. But there's this, this origin moment where they go, they go to federal prisons um, through draft resistance and, and then sort of become more radical and, and larger and put pressure on the state to the point where they're actually the central concern and sort of the vanguard of radical organizing by, by the early 60s. Right. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm Ted Johnson, a senior fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice and a 2017 National Fellow. Um, and this, is a, a, this book event is brought to you by the New American National Fellows Program and Solid State Books. And I'm with Garrett Felber, the author of Those Who Don't Know Say, or yes, Those Who Know Don't Say. And there's a second part of that that I always sort of mix up. Um, yeah. And he's an assistant professor at the, of history at the University of Mississippi. Um, if you've got questions, look for the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and submit your questions there. We'll get to those in just a few minutes. Um, my next question for you, Garrett, is about, uh, you write in the book that the court is, uh, is like a theater. It's, it's a a place of where incarcerated Muslims can sort of take on the state, but do so with in the public eye. And so they begin to use the court as a stage for their protests and for the rights they're, they're trying to secure for themselves. 
So can you talk about this hands-off period of, of the carceral state and then how uh, incarcerated uh, members of the nation use the court as a way of contesting this hands-off approach to prisoners' rights and then sort of transform what that means uh, going forward for the nation, the, the America and the nation of Islam itself. Yeah, yeah. so there's this whole um, almost 100-year period from this ruling Ruffin v. Commonwealth in 1871, which defines incarcerated people as literal uh, slaves of the state um, with no constitutional rights. And, and this period is, char is characterized as the hands-off period, as you said. And by that, they mean that the judicial branch essentially said, we have no say over prison discipline and security. And discipline and security, for folks who don't know, is the most capacious term, right? Everything in prison, in prison official lingo can fall under that umbrella. Right. So, so for the judicial branch to say, we have no um, say in, in prison security is to say, you're at the hands of DOC. And it's really not until the late 50s, early 60s through Muslim prison litigation that this hands-off period is, is challenged successfully um, to bring about the basic idea that prisoners have constitutional rights. And that's, that's one with Cooper v. Pate, which is a case um, out of at Stateville in Illinois. Um, and I sort of write about the cases that lead up to that. But the thing that the, the prison litigation strategy does is one, it just floods the courts with cases. As I mentioned earlier, they're, they're not just filing single cases, they're filing many cases on behalf of every single incarcerated Muslim. And they're asking for very basic religious rights, like ability to correspond with ministers, um, a space to pray, access to black newspapers, which carry Elijah Muhammad's writings, um, religious medals, things like that. But the idea is that that sort of is a gateway to the, the basic premise of constitutional rights. And that's the bedrock then. So Cooper v. Pate is described often as the Brown v. Board of the prisoners' rights movement. Because once right. prisoners are, are established as, as constitutional subjects, then there's all of these other things that can be raised. Um, but to your point about sort of using the court, not just as a place of legal wrangling, but as a stage, um, so much of, of the challenge of prison organizing and prison activism is its invisibility. You know, the removal, the geographic removal of people from society so they cannot um, make their cases known. And what, the, what these cases so often did, even when they didn't win what they were going in um, to challenge legally, they just used it as a space of testimony to testify. I mean, so often, um, these cases would come in about a single issue, like access to the Quran in Arabic. And they would spend the majority of the trial talking about solitary confinement and loss of good time. So they're really talking about big, broad issues about punishment and constitutionality and cruel and unusual punishment. And the judges would be so frustrated because they'd say like, look, the thing we are here to litigate is whether or not you can access the Quran. Do you have access to that? But they would spend right. days testifying about, um, you know, the, the amount of time they lost off their sentence um, for, for practicing Islam. So there, there are all these ways of sort of creati creatively using um, systems of oppression. I mean, they had no illusions about the courts delivering justice, um, but, but that was the mechanism available. That was the arena in which they could actually testify. Right, and so um, so Malcolm X becomes the central figure. You know, I, I guess it's in the '60s uh, when he sort of rises to prominence. And um, you, you, there's a courtroom scene that you reference in the book where he's, I think, is it some Sumerian or Sumerian, mm -hmm. and where he's brought as like a, a witness of sorts to sort of show that this is not just some political make-believe thing. This is an actual religion. So can you talk about his sort of his the role he plays in the nation in that time period, and then uh, his testimony on the court stand, what that does for the movement writ large. Yeah, so this case, um, basically incarcerated Muslims write to Malcolm and say, we, we need you to be an expert witness on our behalf. Because what, as I mentioned earlier, the state is trying to delegitimize its standing within the Muslim world. Because if right. they can say this isn't a legitimate religion, it's using the guise of religion to actually practice what we're calling hate. Um, then they can use it to, um, to suppress the movement. 
So there's this showdown um, that I recount in the book basically between a Columbia University professor of Islamic jurisprudence who the state uses as their um, expert witness to say this is a you know illegitimate sectarian cult essentially and then Malcolm on the other hand and and what's what's just beautiful about this um, this four days of testimony two of Malcolm and two of this professor is um, really Malcolm goes first and this uh, this judge who's you know a, a white conservative judge is just totally smitten by Malcolm and Malcolm uses his platform I mean he does this riff this is in um, late 62 he basically does a, a sort of dry run of message to the grassroots one of his most famous speeches where he's talking about you know, the field Negro and the house Negro and the, the Negro revolution and the black revolution. I mean, he's doing this riffing all through his testimony to a federal judge. Um, but, but he's so compelling that essentially by the time this, this Columbia University professor starts going up there and listing all of his honorary degrees, the judge is like, well, I, you know, I don't know that you're actually an expert on Islam. Um, so, so on one hand, it's just this incredible uh, use of testimony and of Malcolm's sort of rhetorical skills. I mean, I think back to, to the autobiography, that famous scene where he says that he wants to be a lawyer when he's a kid, mm -hmm. right? And the white teacher tells him, you know, oh no, no N-word can be a lawyer. And right. there's this moment where I'm like reading this testimony of Malcolm in court and it's just, you know, um, beautiful the way he runs circles around everyone in there. Um, but I think it's also just uh, evidence of the way that testimony can function um, rather than just being about, I mean, they, they, they wind up winning some concessions um, in that particular case about being a legitimate religion, but it's also just about using the courtroom to reshift the terrain of debate. Right. You know? I mean, he actually gets a federal judge to apologize for using the word Negro and the judge starts using the word American black man. And, and, and it's just, I think, a fascinating use of uh, a space like that to kind of stage political debate. Yeah. Yeah, our first question um, from uh, a viewer is, in contrast to the Mike Wallace documentary you mentioned, what is your view of Abdur Rahman's Muhammad's inspired documentary, Who Killed Malcolm X? That's, I think it's playing on Netflix right now. Have you seen that? And, what, and you write in the book, uh, a little bit, you mentioned, you know, his assassination um, and how maybe the people who were convicted of it weren't the ones, you know, behind the actual killing. So what's your sense of the documentary? Um, yeah, so I'm briefly in the documentary. Um, and, you know, I have, I guess, mixed feelings about it. Um, I'll say the thing I, the thing that I think we should be doing, which the documentary um, does well is thinking about the role of the state in Malcolm's assassination. Um, and, and, and again, I think the documentary could go further in thinking about state complicity. So one of the things that I started doing around 2014 was trying to get the case reopened um, based on some evidence that another person was um, taken from the scene who was an NYPD undercover cop. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the thing that the documentary falls into, which we often fall into, is just um, these narratives of innocence and guilt. And I kind of talk about this in the in the last chapter about what a a fiction that is, really, of the state um, to think about these hard lines between innocence and guilt, which essentially mask the violence of the state, the ever-present violence of the state, the way that the state creates the conditions for the assassination in itself. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it's absolutely clear to me that two of the three men convicted of Malcolm's assassination were not there that day, did not participate in the assassination, um, were wrongfully convicted and did years in prison, and that's unjust. Um, but I think stopping the story there without talking about the deep role of state violence in, in creating the conditions for Malcolm's assassination, whether or not they're the ones who pulled the trigger, is the conversation we need to have I guess the only other thing I'll say about um, that documentary, but really I think just the genre of documentaries that we tend to consume and produce is we often talk about people's deaths, 
without reckoning with why they're important figures in our histories. So mm. I think, you know, the thing that I find lacking from most um, documentaries on Malcolm is a real ex exploration of his ideas, of his anti-colonialism, of his internationalism, of um, his role in anti-police brutality organizing, right? Sure. So, so I think it's such a given that Malcolm's important, but why is he important? What are the lessons that Malcolm gives us today for freedom struggles? And I think that's the thing that I find missing again and again and again um, and when I participated in that project, I really emphasized, like, look, I want to talk about his life and his ideas, right. not just assassination. Um, okay, the next question is, uh, because of the example of Malcolm and the Nation of Islam, it has become almost cliche for incarcerated persons to adopt Islam and the search for knowledge as core to their personal redemption. And so the, the viewer is interested in your take on that legacy for today's prison education and personal redemption efforts slash narratives. Uh, and so I think, you know, again, this, going back to the pop culture, there's, remember in Living Color, there's like the, I forgot the character's name, but he goes to prison and comes out using all of these very big words and sort of the implication is that uh, the nation has become a place for his education and, and knowledge and he becomes enlightened there, but does so in a way that is, um, I mean, they, they sort of poke fun at it a little bit, but there does seem to be something to uh, people discovering a spirituality through the nation while incarcerated. And I guess the question is kind of getting at, is there something to the redemption that folks find in, the, in that religion in prison um, that's analogous to efforts just around general education or redemption efforts for the current moment around you know, second chances and, and uh, reducing recidivism, that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, obviously, there are many reasons to adopt spirituality while caged, right? I mean, there's, right, yeah. you know, so I think just setting that aside and not um, trivializing that in any way. Um, but also, I mean, I'm a big supporter, um, very active in political education efforts inside working with incarcerated people to make sure that um, radical material gets into prisons. Um, you know, it's this, the next project I'm working on is a biography of Martin Sastre, who is um, a, a figure in the book. Uh, yeah. 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 So he, so he becomes a political prisoner, um, actually, in the late 60s. But before that, he characterizes himself as a politicized prisoner, someone who came to prison and became politicized around conditions of confinement. And I think that happens for so many folks who um, understand the confinement not only of the prison in real time, but the confinement of, of their life prior to coming to prison. Um, to, to sort of explore through books, whether it's the autobiography of Malcolm X or other radical literature like George Jackson, Asada, uh, and others, to sort of understand America writ large um, as, a, as a carceral state, as a, a prison nation that creates all sorts of forms of criminalization, um, and, and enclosure. So, so I think the prison is absolutely a space of, of politicization um, and we should encourage that and organize with people inside um, and really make sure that uh, radical literature gets inside. Because if we think back to M Malcolm's own politicization in prison, I mean, I think he plays up in the autobiography the extent to which he's apolitical when he comes to prison, like his parents right. were Bundyites, so he's not new to this. Right. But it's through the debate team, it's through the library and, and reading literature. And for so many of these folks that I write about who are engaged in this activism, I mean, the, the Nation of Islam isn't just um, hosting Juma on Fridays, they're also doing black history lessons. They're also teaching current events. So it's a whole program of understanding the world around you and your role in it. And I think that's something that, um, that we should all be supportive of. Yeah. Yeah, there, here are two questions that are um, somewhat related. Uh, the first is, um, isn't the primary problem with the nation, isn't the primary problem that the nation of Islam has is with its status within mainstream Islam and that Muhammad is the seal of prophecy. And so by definition, you can't have Elijah Muhammad also as, as a prophet, which sort of rolls into this next question about common um, understandings and misperceptions around the history of the Nation of Islam and uh, the ways that the nation from this particular era of the 50s and 60s 
how they should be remembered. Uh, again, there's sort of the where Malcolm splits with the nation because he he sort of sees, I guess he goes to Mecca and sees, hey, wait a minute, all Muslims aren't black, even though the argument is that all black folks are Muslims. And so if if he's gotten that enlightenment over the course of his journey, um, what is what is the message for America today about like how should the nation be remembered or understood in that period, um, both what it does in the carceral state, but also its larger relationship with the, the, um, the broader religion. Yeah, okay, there's a lot there. Yeah, um, there is. It's a ton. Yeah, so, so, you know, to the, to the question of the seal of the prophets, yes, so there, there is a sort of um, question, that's one of many, uh, about the relationship between the nation of Islam and Sunni Islam, right? And um, especially during that period. And in the book, it's, I'm less concerned with saying, no, this is in fact, quote unquote, orthodox Islam, or this isn't, but rather, what does it mean for the state largely to be saying this is not, I mean, the state officials uh, become yeah. arbiters of what constitutes legitimate and illegitimate forms of Islam. And mm -hmm. they do that specifically to co-opt and disrupt black radical organizing. So I think that's the important lesson there. And, and secondly, to say that that narrative um, that Malcolm gives in the autobiography, it's, it's crafted for a particular reason. I mean, he starts that autobiography at a time where he's still in the nation. And the point of the book is to be a testament, a living testament to Elijah Muhammad. And in the process of writing that book, he leaves the nation and is about to be assassinated. So there's there's all sorts of ways that we need to interrogate and historicize our readings of the autobiography. And the reason that he does particular things in the book to say, I went, you know, I made Hajj in 1964 and had all these realizations. I mean, he was he was in in these communities in 1959 abroad. He he's this is he's right. not seeing this for the first time, you right. know. Um, and what's happening from the late 50s onward is the Nation of Islam is consulting with um, Muslims from around the globe, especially one who I write about, Abdul Basid Naim from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, they're introducing Arabic to their school rooms. They're thinking about sort of their place within the Muslim world. So I guess that's the second point I'd say is that they are very conscious about their role within the Muslim Ummah. Um, and then to your, to your last question about how we should remember the nation of Islam, especially during this period of the 50s and 60s. I think there's a very dangerous mainstream narrative, which is that, um, that Mal one, we see the nation only through Malcolm. Um, we see it through Malcolm or Elijah Muhammad or Muhammad Ali or Louis Farrakhan. So we just see it right. through the kind of charismatic male figures. So that's one, I recommend everyone read Eula Taylor's uh, wonderful book about women in the nation of Islam, mm. uh, The Promise of Patriarchy. Um, or is it the promise of protection? Oh, sorry, you if, I, <laughs> if I'm messing up your title. Um, and, um, you know, so that's the, the problem with seeing it through um, Malcolm only is that what happens is the narrative becomes Malcolm wants to be political and the nation holds him back. Mm -hmm. And eventually he has to split because he wants to join the civil rights movement. That's the narrative. And what I try to show in this book is that there's all these ways on the ground, especially locally, that the Nation of Islam is a part of the movement, you know, whether or not you see them a, a part of the civil rights movement, they're a part of the black freedom struggle. They're in right. constant dialogue with people who we see as part of the civil rights movement. And they have real fundamental issues where they merge and where they diverge. And we have to see that that is part of, you know, the diversity of what the black freedom struggle is. And it's not simply about Malcolm warring against the nation to make it political. It was always political. And it was about what does that politics look like? Um, and how will they be engaged nationally or locally in different struggles? Yeah. Uh, the next question asks, um, it, this is, uh, the question is, did you uncover interesting or surprising ways in which the state hides its tracks as it works to repress and surveil dissidents or others that's defined as subversive. And I was actually, I was struck uh, in the book by how much innovation around surveillance was happening just to surveil members of the Nation of Islam in prison and then 
in neighborhoods where they after that where they re-entered after leaving prison. But could you just talk about that that relationship between the surveillance state, uh, the carceral state, and uh, and uh, members of the nation? Yeah. So I think that's how I would answer that. Is yeah, it less surprising that they um, were covering their tracks because they don't really. Um, right. right? It's, it's more surprising about the extent to which I think um, these organizations, these surveillance networks work together. Um, so I think we tend to think about COINTELPRO and the FBI as kind of this like, you know, this effort that's just a single, it's Hoover, again, kind of like told through a single person even. Um, right. and, and, you know, talking with um, former members of the Bureau of Special Services, which was the, the surveillance unit in New York, they had an FBI um, liaison in their office who just spent all day feeding the information that they were getting to the FBI. Um, and then you see sort of the state police files that were where I got most of the information about surveillance in New York state prison. So you had a state police unit, which was called, called a non-criminal investigation unit. So it's basically, um, a repurposed red squad that was right. used to sort of monitor communist organizing and then expanded to include um, black radical organizing. And they're doing things as, as minute as having undercover officers in prison surveilling members of the nation. And then as you point out, when people get paroled, they would always convey that information to the local offices there. So I think, I think, um, I can't say that that was surprising, but really seeing the depth of the surveillance at all levels and the coordination between them um, right. and the way that, again, this gets back to that question about like producing knowledge. So they actually hire someone um, in New York prisons to just sort of cull all this data together, you know, membership of the Nation of Islam. Um, he would do a book review of C.R. Lincoln's book. And then he would take that and he would send it across the country to other, because in California, they're trying to figure out, you know, the same things. Um, so just understanding that web um, and the way that they're actually producing uh, ways of knowing the nation of Islam and how those carceral, um, that carceral knowledge really permeates our society and the way that we think about organizing. Yeah. You, in the book, talking about uh, three rebellions. Um, and uh, the, the last question that we have from, from, the, from the, the viewer is what lessons from this time can be applied to today? And I, I wonder if there is, uh, if there's something in those rebellions that you sort of wrap the book up with that give us some sense of the protests we're seeing today, the uh, prison abolition movement, the interact like the relationship between the correct the criminal justice system writ large and Black America. Um, if you could sort of talk through those rebellions and then if there are lessons that that apply to today, I, you know that's one of the questions here. Yeah, um, so I, I think it's helpful to think about. I I wrote this. I started this book as a dissertation, um, really the writing in earnest, kind of after Ferguson. So I was writing this over the course of Ferguson to last year, um, and. And I say that to say that, you know, all of these issues about organizing against police violence and killings, um, Islamophobia, state surveillance, I mean, during that time frame, all of this stuff was percolating, right? The BIE, um, right. Black Identity Extremists report came out. And so now it's like, the book comes out and people are like, oh, wow, like this is touching on so many things that, it, and it's like, those things are always happening. That's the thing is like, there is never a time where anti-carceral organizing, state repression, anti-black violence is not relevant because that is the foundation of this society. And, you know, I ended it with, um, with Harlem 64, Watts 65, and Attica 71, in part because everything, so everything we've talked about so far happened prior to that, mm -hmm. right? And the way that those uprisings were narrated at the time, especially by journalists, um, and people outside the movement was about sp spontaneity, right? Spontaneous rebellion, disorganization. Um, and the reason I wanted to end with that is because you can, you can think about, say, Attica in 1971. And there's no way that you get a thousand people in D yard to organize 27 demands and hostages that are going to 
be your only chance at both executing those demands and protecting yourself, which they ultimately still can't do because of the right. extent of state violence. But there's no way you get that in, in 24 hours without decades of organizing. Right. I think we often conflate planning with organizing. So it's not that Attica Watts or Harlem were planned, right. but they're organized. They're organized because this stuff is, is years in the making. And I think that's the lesson today as well, is there's nothing spontaneous happening right now. This is organized. This is the organizing that's happened since Ferguson right. that's now being put into play. Um, so that's one lesson is that the sort of knee jerk reaction to, oh, now I see this, it's immediately apparent to me, so it must be new. It's not, okay. it's organized, right. right, over a period of, long uh, of a long time. Um, the other is just, um, I think, I was asking myself throughout the book, what is the role of organizing against police violence in a more sustained revolutionary movement? Because there's this moment after Stokes is killed, that opening anecdote, where there's this coalition against police violence as an issue that affects um, black and brown communities writ large, regardless of their differences in, in political affiliation or religion. Or, right. um, and so there, there's this incredible possibility for police violence to organize a mass movement, but those mass movements very quickly diverge politically in what their responses are. We see that now, right, with eight can't wait versus eight to abolition and kind of like, right. are we talking about banning excessive violence? Or are we talking about abolishing the police? Right. Um, and I think they're incredibly difficult to sustain over time and develop into a full-fledged revolutionary movement without an understanding of the deeper systematic ways that something like um, police killing is connected to daily, everyday violence of, of policing, um, prisons, and the, and the carceral state. So, um, so I think it's, we're in an incredible moment, and the lessons that I see in this book is kind of understanding the long durée of organizing against these forms, and the deep structural, that these are not, the, the thing that we're seeing now, that some people see now as the problem, is, is so deep. It's, it's rooted in racial capitalism. It's not, you know, you're seeing the manifestation of that with the killing of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, um, but that's just the manifestation. It's not the problem itself. So I think the key to this sort of like long, long form using um, police violence as a catalyst for a long sustained movement is understanding those deeper connections and the role of organizing over time. Yeah, and I mean, it that's so true. I, I mean, I remember back to the 92 LA riots and those, they did not happen just in response to Rodney King. That was in response to decades of police brutality. And Ferguson was not in response, like you said, just to Michael Brown. And the, even the Department of Justice report, which kind of said, well, maybe Brown, you know, wasn't as, as innocent as Biden Sanders made him out to be. However, there is a long-standing history of police abuse in this um, part of, of the county, and um, not just brutality, but in terms of like ticketing and fines and fees and all that sort of thing. So you're right, and I mean, your entire book talks about the, the way um, interaction with police and the corrections department adds fuel to the fire uh, to the, the, the rights and privileges of citizenship that, that uh, the members of the nation are trying to claim for themselves. Um, so I, we're almost out of time. I think the last question is on July 4th, Farrakhan sort of gives his address to the nation. And I'm curious if you think the period in the 50s and 60s um, where the Nation of Islam was part of the Black freedom struggle, is that still the case today? Or has, has their moment kind of passed because of controversy, the wrong charismatic figure at the head? Or are they still, you know, can they still be considered along some of the other leading civil rights activists to the extent such a thing even exists anymore? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I think I'll sort of point to actually what I, what I think was happening then as well, which is that um, if we only understand the nation of Islam through charismatic leadership, right, we're gonna miss right. local organizing. Um, 
So I, I do think it was, a, it was a different organization and a different time that it was organizing in. Um, but I think, for example, if we had looked at what Elijah Muhammad was saying in 1961, as many have, and said, this is what the Nation of Islam is, right? Because Elijah Muhammad at that time was saying, we're not a political organization. You know, we are Muslims and, you know, we are interested in building up our communities and black businesses. And that wasn't wrong, but it's sort of the point of the title of the book, right? Those who know don't say is that there's right. a strict silence around what the nation is doing. Um, so at the same time that Elijah Muhammad was saying that and people have built whole arguments about the nation out of that, people like Martin Sastre are organizing really revolutionary movements within Attica. So I guess I would say the same thing today, which is that if we only think about, I mean, the, the nation of Islam is never talked about outside of what Louis Farrakhan has said. And Louis Farrakhan is only talked about when he's sort of making some incendiary remark, right? It's never about like what the day-to-day -day organizing of the nation is doing. Um, so I think it's a larger lesson really in, in terms of how we think about organizations. And I think there's all sorts of trappings to, to understanding movements through organizations rather than through networks and, and activists, you know, who, who's working with the nation but aren't actually part of the nation. Right, like who's organizing with Muslims that that don't even see themselves as part of the nation, but are in the same network doing the same work. So I think that's really a lesson right. in how we think about social movements. Excellent, well done. Well, thank you, uh, Garrett Felber, for um, sharing your book with us. Um, for those watching, you please go buy the book. Those who know, don't say wherever books are sold, but especially at Solid State Books. And um, thanks to New America and the National Fellows Program for hosting this event. Uh, I'm Ted Johnson. This has been great, Garrett. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for the great questions, Ted. It's a pleasure.